Joining us today, we're happy to have Eric Hill, who is the Chief Information Officer of New York Foundling. Could you give us a little, little background on what is New York Foundling? Sure, sure. So uh, the New York Foundling is a 150-year-old uh, organization uh, with a promise to our neighbors and that we are working with children, adults, and families uh, to help them basically reach their full potential. And uh, so with that, uh, we are one of the largest and longest serving nonprofits in New York. Um, and uh, we can pride ourselves in being established and innovative, uh, people-centered and data-driven. What leads Foundling to take the path to automation? Um, you know, how did, how did you guys you know, get started and, and, and sort of what, what kick-started that for you? Yeah, no, it's an interesting journey for a 150-year-old organization to be talking about automation uh, and robots, right? Uh, totally love it. <laughs> uh, so our journey began basically in, in 2017 when we came up with our big, hairy, audacious goal, uh, where we wanted to really look at how we unlock the potential of all of our staff. And then we went into 2018 looking at What's our five-year strategic goals? Uh, what matters to us? And then from there, we formulated basically a strategic plan for digital transformation. We've heard from, from many of our customers and our partners that the, uh, the pandemic has been a real catalyst for scaling automation. Um, has it been a catalyst for accelerating um, the scaling of automation at, at New York Foundling? Uh, like many organizations, I'll say it's probably an understatement to say that it's been a catalyst for transformation. Uh, the pandemic and COVID-19 uh, has really transformed our organization in unprecedented, unexpected ways in, in many respects. Over the course of three days, uh, we accelerated a five-year sort of digital transformation plan, uh, and we're live. And so wow. what we've been doing uh, is actually enabling about 3,000 of our staff um, who regardless of where they are, uh, whether they're working in a residential facility uh, that we operate or a clinic or a school um, or working from home, we wanna make sure that everyone has the tools and capabilities to be successful as we continue to uh, provide services to the, the folks that we serve, which are the children, the adults, uh, the communities uh, that surround us. And are there, um, are there any, any specific COVID related automation um, stories that, that emerged? Yeah. Uh, well, in reality, uh, yes. And so uh, there's a mantra out there, and I, I think it uh, almost bears repeating, uh, the preparation plus opportunity equals luck. I, I feel oddly very lucky uh, to have sort of the support of UiPath, the bridge program uh, for nonprofits to help us really look at what we can do to enable our staff, given the fact that uh, they're not in their normal setting. You know, uh, many of our uh, administrative staff and those who do sort of financial processing are, are typically with dual monitors sitting in a very comfortable chair in an office uh, and have a very sort of static work uh, pattern, uh, as well as our clinicians rely upon the same sort of features when they come into our offices. They sit down and they've got dual monitors, great keyboard, great mouse, um, pretty much not a lot of kids running around the office. I mean, we do provide services. <laughs> but what we found is that uh, we had to address the reality that um, with this pandemic, people are working in um, uh, places that you expected. You know, some are working from their parents' homes, some are working from bedrooms, some, are, some have home offices like I do. Uh, many of us uh, really don't have the same tools and, and technologies to, to make their, uh, their work possible in the same sort of manner that we had prior to the pandemic. So what has happened uh, since uh, we kind of launched into the, the shutdown and we, we, we've been looking at how to take our, our pilot, we developed a, a bot uh, with UiPath to uh, automate uh, to the cutting and pasting that happens in the middle of the night. And what we now have is accelerated that forward. Uh, we are building out a set of bots to help to transition a lot of the manual work that was done done when we had a really convenient office location, uh, letting the robots do that for us so that we can really refocus and rededicate towards the, the pandemic and response uh, programs. So um, speed has been this, this quality that we've heard, you know, is incredibly important, has been sort of come to the front of the line during the pandemic. So, so I was going to ask um, if, you, if you agreed that speed is, is more important now than ever. Oh, without a doubt. 
uh, and which again is sort of odd for a 150 year old organization to say uh, that we've, we've been around for a while uh, and you would expect it to be sort of very pragmatic in terms of our approach to things. Uh, what we know for a fact is that we are dynamically adjusting our services and our supports to the reality of today. Uh, and with sort of automation, we're looking at the next 150 years. How do we actually make sure that our, t our staff uh, with the limited time that they have uh, during the work hours to maximize their contribution back to society. And, you know, with UiPath, with automations, with robotic process autom automations, we're, we're really making a difference in terms of being able to kind of give them the time to rededicate to their clients, uh, to spend time in, in professional development, um, and really just reconnecting uh, with family and loved ones as well and make sure that they're not having to do repetitive, you know, manual work after hours. Instead, uh, we're really helping with their uh, work-life balance. We've heard that, you know, having the agility to react to whatever may happen, um, and in this particular crisis, uh, you know, uh, being, you know, people working from home, having to, to shift, uh, you know, how we did business very quickly, um, you know, the agility of change, uh, automation has been you know, really key there. And on the flip side, resiliency, um, you know, using automation to build resiliency in processes, hardening processes, making sure that continuity of business um, is, is ensured. Um, you know, how, how do those factors play in for you guys? Yeah, and I would even say uh, business continuity, right, is enabled through automations. And, uh, I think it's important to note that what, what guides us and what drives us, and that's about uh, the service excellence in terms of our the way that we care for those that are in our in our hands. And what we want to do is be able to take uh, these tools and activate um, sort of a shift in mindsets as to how we can accomplish our goals together. And so a lot of those have to do with uh, being able to think about what matters the most, how do we actually create quality of services, and then how do we keep a focus on things that are critical to our success. And all of these things play out relative to, you know, what's happening now, the the need for resiliency, which is when the when we're not able to go into the offices, we have full capacity that we need to be resilient and responsive. Uh, and this allows us to really kind of propel forward and look at uh, using all of these capabilities to, to drive in a new direction that uh, we probably would have gone in, in normal circumstances, but we've actually kind of gone in hyperscale as a result of the pandemic. Um, Eric, is, is automation a C-level imperative in your organization? And could you speak to that, um, why it's important for CEOs and boards to, to care about automation? Yeah, I, it's, it's um, a, a complicated story to tell, but the result is very simple. Um, automation is core to achieving our mission as we sort of strive to exceed expectations for delivery services for our funders, right? So the people who are paying our bills, it, especially in a time like this, this the, the capabilities to automate and ensure that we have continuity of, of services is critical. And uh, it's of high value to our clients as well. So if we can spend more time in client services where we're not worried about, you know, some of the, the mundane aspects of of the oversight that's really critical for the work that we do with foster care children, with the developmentally disabled. Uh, we really want to talk uh, about how automation enables us to do a better job and do more of those. I think it starts with um, the big picture. So, right, we're driven by sort of our strategic goals. And uh, then we went into mediation process with our staff to talk about what are the things that make a difference? Uh, because, you know, we believe that together, uh, we are 100% responsible for ensuring that everyone is embracing the foundling's heart uh, as we strive to reach their full potential. And with that, um, we looked at all of the processes that we're doing on a daily basis. We sifted through all of that and we started to look at what are those that um, uh, really are surfacing as we need to do something about this. We're hearing our staff say, hey, that we need to do something. Uh, we're looking for those that are volume. Right, so there's a tremendous amount of activity that we would want to invest in solving a, a problem, and then we all look at the complexity. So the lower the complexity, the the better fit it is. So high volume, uh, low complexity uh, is a great fit. And so, uh, for example, our first bot that we launched uh, uh, a couple months ago 
was uh, something that takes, uh, on average, a clinician about four hours per week uh, to do cutting and pasting because they're going into our system, they're getting the data, and they have to go find the data, and they have to go into the state system and, and paste that data in. Uh, it can take about four hours a week. So, right, 16 hours a month times 500 staff. So, ooh, that's an opportunity. So that's really how we think about uh, opportunity automation is uh, making sure that we're listening to what matters to our staff that's aligned with where we're going and that actually meets some, some entry criteria, some screening criteria that we can then prioritize where we're going to invest. How do, you, how do you then measure the effectiveness, right? Because we hear, you know, often, mm -hmm. well, you know, ROI and we're, mm -hmm. we're looking at the cost savings, you know, uh, around the automation provided. But the more and more I talk to people in the real world doing this, it's not always about the bottom line savings. It's often employee you know, satisfaction or the customer experience. So what are some of the, and I, you know, I'm, it sounds like that's where you, you were going with some of the, the rationale for doing automations, but what's important to you in terms of measuring the effectiveness of an automation? Uh, I, I love the question um, because I do think that um, it's strategic and operation nature. One is that uh, we are constantly thinking about mission, vision, values, and goals, uh, and that how do we, what's the lens that we look at our success? And that really comes from those that we serve, the children, the adults, the families, and the communities that we serve. So it, automation isn't, that, that journey isn't about the technology. So the the inclination is to judge the widget, you know, how, how quick or how many errors to generate or how many, uh, you know, iterations you have to go through to generate that technology. Uh, in our world, it's really about looking at what can we do to improve the quality of the lives that we serve. That's how we judge our, our efforts. And in this case, you know, when we look at our, our primary uh, pilot in a, the bot that we created, it was about how much time can we give back to our staff to do more, to, to spend more time investing in the people that we care about. And so, yeah, so that is really our measure of success is we achieved that goal. Have we made someone's life better as a result of implementing a bot? So it's hard to follow that up with a question because I was going to ask about center of excellence, but I want, I, it is related to do the, the employees at the founding um, bring ideas you know, are they passionate about the automation and do they bring ideas that they would like to um, have automations? You know, they're the closest to the, the problems, right? No, I think you're, I think you're onto something there, which is that um, the, the, the core of, of what we do within the digital services space, right? We're the enabling factor. The, the reality is, is that the folks who are doing the work have the best perspective of what needs to be done. And that, that's true, whether it was, you know, providing a meal uh, in a classroom in one of our schools um, or, you know, providing a help desk service, right? And in that phone call. Um, the, the, the value proposition is about the employee experience, making sure that they're equipped to do what they need to do. So what we've done uh, with this concept, right, of, of how, do, how do we we do this automation, how do we come up with a, a framework that works, is we've instilled sort of a product owner mindset that uh, everyone is part of this agile team where we look at everyone has the ability to make a contribution. Um, and through a whole process, we, we gather those ideas and, you know, through a fun process, uh, we then cultivate what, what matters the most. Uh, and those are coming from our employees as they should. Uh, and they're coming from key stakeholders to help come up with a, a roadmap that is dynamically changing because the world changes around us. And so for us, you know, a robot for every person isn't a vision. It's actually a reality. Like we're looking at, uh, taking, you know, a look at all of our, our routine automations to eliminate cutting and pasting. We're also going into how do we actually provision care? How, how do we do that meal tracking or the attendance tracking for the, the child who's coming into one of the schools? Uh, we're doing that through automations on the back end with care bots on the front end because that's the employee experience we, we want to provide is allow them to get their work done as easy as possible. And a lot of times uh, it's just not possible without uh, having sort of unique tools and capabilities that we're building together with our employees. And the UiPath, uh, you know, provides us with a, a set of capabilities. One is obviously with the, building the bots in order to make some of the data move between systems, but it's also like the automation hub. We're rolling that as we speak. Um, and with that space, we now have a, a 
this collective wisdom. It's crowdsourcing of ideas. And I think that that's brilliant. I think, you know, it invests in staff to acknowledge the work that they're doing. And it also allows us to find the best ideas and bring them to life. Absolutely. Um, can we peek behind the curtain just a little bit? And can you tell us how you guys are structured in terms of, you know, centralization of this? So now obviously having the employees feed the, in the innovations to you and using Automation Hub as, as sort of the, the centralized crowdsourcing capability. But where does that go? Where do, the, where do the automations go? Do you have a center of excellence? Uh, we've worked with our um, clinical and administrative staff to really become partners for innovation, right? So in, in what we're trying to build out is, uh, and I, I heard this yesterday, I was, I was on a CIO forum and uh, one of the other CIOs was saying, you know, it's about this hyperscale digital transformation. And so how do we make that possible? Uh, it's about setting ourselves in motion with a framework that works, right? So uh, we believe in proven practices as an organization and you know, we are inspired by data to help make informed decisions. And so what we, we've really done is uh, we've visualized this concept of a center of excellence where uh, why can't everyone be in the center of excellence? So we are all the center of excellence. And so with that, we have uh, groups get together in terms of focusing in on a problem, uh, regardless of their title, uh, their level, uh, their expertise in many cases uh, is fluid because we need a lot of different types of skills at the table. And so we use that agile mindset with a product owner perspective to it, and then run uh, you know, at, at hyperscale in, uh, in a human services organization, right? 150 year old organization making these transformations possible because we're bringing together centers of excellence. And it's based upon what do we need to get done? We'll bring those people together. You said you reiterated a 150 year old organization. And that's exactly what I was thinking, you know, that these kinds of service organizations don't often have this level of sophistication and, you know, hunger for, for, for being sort of future, understanding how technology actually is going to make your vision and your mission a reality for, for the people. We want to give people tangible, tangible ideas for how to get started so they can get traction immediately. So i um, hoping they can learn from you. How, how, did, how did you roll out or, uh, automation across the organization? How did you get started? The, the story is, is uh, very compact because we had a need, we had an opportunity to do the right thing, and then we wanted to make a seismic shift to demonstrate the capabilities and learn from, from that experience. So uh, what we ended up doing is, you know, we deployed to the Azure cloud, uh, right? So very tactical. Uh, instead of spinning up servers in our, in our own data center, uh, we went to our friends at Microsoft and actually just installed the environment. Uh, and there's uh, some very simple glide paths to do that with UiPath. Uh, and then we went into a pre-intention process with our stakeholders. So we, we identified that high volume, low complexity opportunity. And we brought everyone into a, a, a virtual room in many cases. So even then we were, we were kind of working virtual formation um, with a, what is it that we, we want to accomplish? I, we're setting our goals for success at the very beginning. Uh, and then we looked at what are the, all of the ideas and turning them into stories so that we don't confine people with tasks. So we're using this Al approach to saying, uh, let's talk about what we want to accomplish in a narrative. And then from there, we'll go into sort of a sprinting process, coming up with a backlog of, of sprints with things that we're going to get done at the end of that sprint together, bringing people onto the team, onboarding them, uh, doing the daily standups, right? All of the normal scrum agile activities uh, with retrospectives and demos at the end. And then, uh, you know, do it all over again and again and again. Uh, and little by little, the team learns how to be effective as a, as a cohort uh, and the, the product speaks for itself, right? So we, you know, we're saving 100,000 hours a year as a result of the first bot. So yeah, let's do more of that. Were, were, were wow. the employees sort of, um, were they open to it? Did, did, were there cultural sort of barriers in the way to, to, to even getting started? Uh, the answer is yes and no, right? Um, because I think that there's the fear of the unknown, which is a stock phrase that's real. 
that um, we're talking about robots. And so what we tried to do is actually give fair warning, like uh, uh, probably six months in advance, we started looking at what are the types of tools, techniques, and approaches that we want to activate that would be transformative you know, and really bringing that digital transformation to life. So we, we did an interview series with leadership, um, one of our, our programs, our evidence-based programs. Uh, we actually had a, a series of conversations about what matters to us and in order to just allow for that open loop com communication, let people hear that this is where we're at and these are the things that we want to learn together. So Gart Gartner has a really great uh, way to kind of put this into perspective that I love. And it's it's really three simple things, which is shaping your mindset. So shape, right? You, you, gotta, you gotta think in a different way. And you know, at the founding, we believe in trust and the power and potential of all people, right? Which is, includes our staff as much as it includes our clients and our funding sources to make really good decisions. So we're really embracing the new work, um, which is a guidebook that uh, gives you like an operating canvas to actually make a difference in terms of the way you create your organization. Uh, so it's not good enough just to have the shift in mindset, you gotta do something. So that's where we start to shift our practices. So shape shift your practices. Uh, and again, we believe in the power of uh, personal choice and self-determination not only for our clients and those that we serve, but also for our staff. And so we embrace agile, right? It allows for that creativity for people to get into the game, you know, to be welcome at able to have a voice. Um, and we think that that makes a huge difference in terms of our ability to be successful. Ultimately, the, we have to share the results. So we're shaping mindsets, we're shifting our practices, and then we're sharing the results. Uh, be, and we're creating a space where uh, we believe and we invest proven practices, uh, which is really about embracing community and allowing for the conversation about how did it go? And then learning from those moments and bringing it back through the cycle again. So so all of this I think, uh, creates a really dynamic culture uh, that is very difficult in theory, very easy in practical application when you take it into something like this, where we create a unique opportunity that was driven by our employees to talk about how they can make life better for themselves and for their for the clients they serve. And then we looked at what are the techniques and strategies we can use, what are the tools that we can enable. And then we go through this shaping of mindsets, shifting of practices and sharing of the results and just keep doing it over and over. And the more we do it, the better off we are. I mean, it, it really sounds like you you nailed the, the, the fact that this is a cultural shift. So for those who are, you know, just starting their journey, um, what advice would you give them as they get going? You know, what what what, do you, what would you have liked to know going into it? Uh, well, start from the beginning. You, you can't skip step, right? So, and what I mean by that is uh, you've got to know who you are, right? And, and this means that you have folks that with varying sort of experience on your teams uh, and really understanding of the, the process that we're talking about, right? So people are learning as they go. So we know who we are. And, you know, as one of the lar uh, largest and longest serving nonprofit organizations, um, we, we are really people centered and data driven. So we, we took that seriously because that's who we are. And automation is a way for us to achieve our mission. So that's really the purpose and that purpose matters. So that's, that's the first thing is know who you are. The second is know who you serve, right? Uh, and it sounds so simple, it, it's something you have to talk about. In the beginning, the founding is, has really found purpose in supporting our neighbors, uh, right? That, so th we say these words because they have meaning, uh, because we wanna make sure that everyone is on a path to stability and strength and dependence. And really when we talk about robotic process automation, that's what this does. It gives us stability and resiliency, right? And scalability. It gives us the strength uh, to go into the next 150 years. So automation for purpose with a focus on strategic importance, super, super important. Uh, and that narrative matters, know who you serve. And then, you know, the final thing I would say is, um, uh, know what you need to do, <laughs> uh, right? So you, you can you can be great knowing who you are and who you serve, but if you don't have a good bearing on on where you're going and what you need to accomplish, uh, not you're not going to hit the goal. So iteration, right? The 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 sprint demo process where you actually show something that works, uh, because you know just like building a strong house calls for materials and well, so does building the well-being requires these community resources and social relationships and uh, opportunities to be strong uh, of our staff 
in, in this little dynamic community that we're creating. And I don't know that I appreciate just how important it is for that uh, community to form and to be you know, really ground up. And the same is true for enabling our overall digital transformation and activating automations. Like we have to have a really strong community. And frankly, that's, that's uh, we, we know what we need to do, which is we need to activate our community to do the right thing. And that's an inclusive community that fosters sharing and together we're stronger and together we'll learn. There was a recent report um, that Forrester put out called the COVID-19 crisis will accelerate enterprise automation plans. And there was a pull on a quote here uh, that one of the lasting legacies of the pandemic will be a renewed focus on automation. So do you agree with that? And if so, why? Uh, I, I think it's, a, it's an imperative. It's, it's not a renewed. I think that it's always been there, but automation is an imperative. Uh, the data that is surrounding us is growing exponentially, and we have to control it. We have to figure out effective ways to manage it, and we have to find effective ways to enable it to do the right thing, right? So, yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that statement. In the same report, um, I'll read you another quote. Uh, business and technology leaders will continue to invest in emerging intelligent automation technologies to increase the resiliency and adaptiveness of the business. So. We were talking about it earlier. I think adaptiveness and resiliency are really the, the keys here um, that are emerging. You know, why, why does automation increase business resiliency? I think that automation uh, enables business resiliency because it helps advance forward, right? Uh, the demands of information transparency, reliability, um, it really at the core of our ability to deliver services. Uh, even in human services, uh, we are enabled by these digital technologies and automation is our, our our ability to scale, to to do more and to do better. You talked about uh, digital transformation. If you have a digital transformation strategy, what is the role of automation in your digital transformation strategy? Uh, we we absolutely have a digital transformation strategy. It's it's uh, center to sort of how we enable our strategic goals, and within that, uh, we believe that robotic process automations are a key component. We work with a variety of of different sort of sponsors, supporters, funders, uh, key constituents, and what matters in a lot of our relationships is the quality of data. Number one, and then number two is the transparency of the work that we're doing. And so automations enable that to occur. Without that, we have silos of data, we have lakes of data, we have oceans of data that are not as meaningful as when we put them to purpose. And so uh, automations are really our ability to unlock uh, the potential for people to achieve our mission. And that's by giving them the tools and the resources they need to, to make those decisions. What, what I typically hear is, a is, is those who are embracing it saying, well, you know, we were doing, you know, we have a digital transformation program. Um, you know, we've been trying to do things, you know, via programmatic uh, integrations and building it from the bottom up with these, you know, seven, eight, 12 month projects that, you know, by the time we get done, they're not even that, you know, relevant to the business anymore. Um, but automation comes along, RPA comes along and it's this like instant, instant entry into, you know, rapid digital transformation. And so I'm just curious, is that, is, would you agree with that? Automation is one of those opportunities when we talk about strategy, um, a lot of times it's, um, it's abstract, right? It's, it doesn't feel real. Um, automation is one of those areas where it's very real. It's about completing a task. It's about completing an action. It's about improving quality of the data flow. Um, and from there, we are able to have real ROI conversations, like the amount of time we put into, um, you know, our first bot, uh, it was just a fraction uh, of the amount of value that we're going to get as a result of, of unlocking the potential of our staff to work together, right? So again, there's a cultural aspect of it. And then there's also the, what we did is we're enabling our staff to do more. And we're eliminating, you know, when we project all the numbers, everything from one bot, that's 100,000 hours saved. So, so yeah, no, this, this is real. And I think 
uh, when it comes to automation and it comes to digital you know, transformation, uh, it isn't theoretical. It's, it's very, very um, specific to an individual in terms of the value that they can get from it and also to an organization uh, in terms of achieving its goals. And the ROI speaks for itself. You said a robot for every person is not even a vision. A robot for every person is, is, is now for you. Do you have a point of view on how it accelerates human achievement? So a robot for every person, yeah, right. It's, it's not just a vision, it's, it is our new reality. Um, and Daniel Dines, I think, stood on the keynote stage last year at, at Ford uh, and proclaimed, and I, I loved it, uh, that uh, the vision was to save 1 million hours. Um, I challenge that uh, that's what the foundling's gonna do. What will you do? So, right, we're saving 100,000 hours with our first bot. So, Daniel, uh, I challenge, <laughs> let's up our game. Eric, thank you so much. This is just wonderful, a wonderful interview, and it's so good to spend time with you. It, uh, it's really refreshing. Yeah.